now available from National Geographic Home Video. Welcome to Southern Africa's Savuti. Here, hope dawns each morning. But the night spreads fear across the land. When the day ends, the dreaded hunt begins. Journey with National Geographic to witness the rule of the lions of darkness. It's been called the most glamorous job in the world, but these photographers of National Geographic magazine also tell another story. Enduring danger and hardship, they travel the globe to bring back these astonishing images. Their stories are as fascinating as the pictures they take. From exotic locations worldwide, these men and women can take a moment and make it last forever. Now, go behind the lens with National Geographic and meet the photographers. And now, our feature presentation. A far-off land of ice, wind, and rock one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. Described as the crowning glory of the Andes, this is Southern Chile's Torres del Paine National Park. Nearly half a million acres of inspiring wilderness. Black-necked swans and Chilean flamingos add color to this pristine landscape. Large herds of camel-like wanakos run the hills, and condors brighten wild skies. They look for the kills of the most dramatic creature here, a shy and secretive predator. This mysterious hunter has mastered the art of invisibility and no one has ever filmed them like this before. This is the American Lion of the Mountains, a frightening presence to their prey, especially Wanakos. These great cats are honored in tribal mythology because of their cunning and stealth. Indigenous peoples gave them many names, including cougar, panther, and mountain lion. But here they are known by the Inca name, puma, meaning strong and powerful. At home in mountains and tropical forests, hot deserts and deep snow, this is one of the most adaptable of all land mammals. It is also one of the most difficult to observe. But the single-minded quest of one man brings us the first ever documentary of pumas living naturally in the wild. Hugh Miles lived in the wilderness with these impressive predators for two years, learning their habits and hiding places. He even won the trust of one particular puma, bringing us a unique portrait of this magnificent cat, this golden ghost, this elusive Lion of the Andes.
Flying Apollo-like over North America, the Rockies can be seen tumbling down towards the Caribbean. Then, in South America, the Andes stretch almost to Antarctica. These mountain ranges are the domain of the mountain lion. But ruthless persecution has driven it to the remotest corners, such as Chile's Torres del Paine National Park. Few places offer better hiding for fearful cats and few have such beautiful, wild skies. Swept by storms raging in from the Pacific Ocean, these rugged mountains are a battleground for the elements. But this is Patagonia, made famous in literature as a totally inhospitable place at the end of the world. This windswept place is home to several pumas, but they are seldom seen. Indeed, experts have claimed that it would be virtually impossible to make a film about the life of a wild puma. But this does not discourage Hugh Miles. Hugh has already lived on intimate terms with many wild animals and relishes the challenge of trying to find these elusive cats. Filming pumas is a daunting prospect but I love these inspiring landscapes and the chance of getting to know such beautiful cats is a real privilege. That Wanako is alarmed, as well it might be. There are two pumas on that far hill. I can only just make them out, but one's bigger than the other. Maybe a mother and large cub, or a male and female. They're looking a bit nervous, but I'll try to get closer. It's always exciting when approaching an animal for the first time, especially something as charismatic as a big cat. Wow, well, he's not happy. Those flattened ears mean he's terrified. This is going to be difficult. The cat stayed rooted to the spot until nightfall, and then vanished. But Hugh is set for the long haul. He'll live in the wilds for months at a time, for more than two years if necessary. And though the pumas are shy, many of the animals, such as wanakos and foxes, are quite tame. Some are very tame. After only a couple of weeks, I have this charming little grey fox completely trusting me. And I hope in time I'll win the trust of a wild puma. My helper in this quest is an old friend from Argentina, Donaldo Macaiva. We're a team of just two to limit disturbance. Our search for pumas begins where they've been seen in the past. Lake Sarmiento is huge, like an inland sea, its coast riddled with caves. But pumas are solitary animals with large territories so there are probably only a few cats along this whole shoreline. A travelling cat will more than likely follow the coast, so I hide with the camera close to the shore, while Donny watches from a distance to warn me if a cat is approaching. Then we wait. And wait. But we're lucky. After only three days, a cat is heading our way. Hello, Hugh, do you copy? Yeah, go ahead. There's one coming around the coast now. It's looking pretty nervous. Should be about three minutes. OK, thanks, Donald. I'll be careful. It's looking a bit tense. Obviously aware that something odd is hidden in the bushes. 
one lovely cat. A female, I think. Six feet of feline grace. That's lucky, she's going into a cave. I'll concentrate on this one spot and see if she gets used to me. A couple of days later, she's at the cave again. She's coming out. Oh dear, what an angry cat. The fire in those eyes. If looks could kill. The trouble is she could kill. Mountain lions have fatally injured a couple of people in the US recently. But there's really no danger, as long as I remain sensitive to her moods. Anyway, she's much more afraid of me. Those ears are so expressive turned back listening to me. Yes, I'm sure she's a female. She has a thinner face than that male we saw earlier. And this is encouraging. She isn't fleeing. If she sticks around, she might be our star. We soon learn that she'll accept only one person at a time. So Donnie looks for other cats while I tried to get her used to me being out in the open. And after several weeks, it's working. Well, sort of. She's wagging her tail in annoyance. I wonder what goes on in her mind. Eye contact is most important to a cat. And I have to look away to release the tension. I seem to be forever waiting by the cave in the hope she's in there. Maybe not this time. Those Wanakos are alarmed. Ah, oh, there she is. So close. Her ears turned back in doubt. But it's fascinating how she looks at me. This is a serious game of cat and mouse. And guess who's the mouse? Luckily, she's beginning to ignore me and my shadow on the rocks. She's more interested in considering whether she could catch those grazing wanakos. Our persistence is beginning to pay off. After three and a half months, she's finally trusting me. It's a wonderful moment. I'm always dubious about giving wild animals names, but she's such a special cat, I'll call her Penny, after an old friend. Sitting beside her, just 20 feet away, a completely wild puma trusting me not to harm her, is one of the greatest privileges I've ever been granted. Now it is spring, Penny has an increasing variety of prey to choose from. Many birds fly in to breed. These are upland geese. And on the more open plains, the ostrich-like rhea thrives, raising many young. Both these species form a part of Penny's diet, but are not as important as the hare. Introduced from Europe at the end of the 19th century, they have flourished and are now the puma's most frequent prey. But the most important source of food are these wild ancestors of the llama, the wanako. Late spring is the time for births, and within two weeks, mating, so males must establish their territories. And this means war.
Even when distracted by their battles, Wanakos are always alert for danger. Though Penny is largely a creature of darkness and more interested in sunbathing at midday, she is an opportunist and will hunt any time there's a chance of success. Puma predation can be a serious problem for Wanakos, so they prefer to feed and give birth on more open areas, as these provide a measure of safety from puma attack. There is also safety in numbers, so most births take place in a period of just two weeks and are of necessity a speedy affair. Young chulengos are a puma's favorite prey, and one wandering away from the herd will attract Penny's attention. Up until now, it's been impossible to film Penny hunting, for if she's being watched by anyone, Wanakos or me, she just gives up. But after several weeks of patience, she's trusting me enough to continue, though with one ear keeping track of me. There is a critical balance between Penny and her prey, an unremitting contest between the puma's stealth and the Wanako's sharp eyes. On most occasions like this, the eyes win. Wanakos are no respecters of fences, and though the park is flanked by sheep ranches, the animals come and go as they please, including some of the pumas. Catching alert Wanakos is usually difficult. Catching sheep is easy, and Penny occasionally crosses the fence. But this brings her into conflict with humans. Sheep farming on the edge of the park is big business, and though pumas are officially protected in Chile, the law is ineffective. Ranchers employ hunters to protect their interests, and with big bounties offered, puma persecution is intense. Our cat Penny is protected in the park, but once the dogs are on her trail, the boundaries might be ignored. After this scrape with the hunter and his dogs, Hugh and Donnie spend several days in futile searching. 
Penny has disappeared. It is then that they find some alarming evidence. There on the shore are the tracks of a puma, followed by those of a horse. The tracks lead to a cave, and to their horror, they find spent rifle shells. Fearing for Penny's life, they summon help from the park authorities. Chilean national parks are administered with admirable integrity and veteran park rangers Jovito Gonzalez and Juan Toro are the first to be concerned when the wildlife of this important wilderness is threatened. There is so much fresh blood in the cave that a cat must have been killed here and dragged away to claim the bounty. The loss of just one puma inside the park is shocking enough but they find the devastating evidence of two more deaths in nearby caves. Hugh and Donnie search for Penny everywhere, but in vain. A police investigation follows, but no guilty party is found, only evidence confirming that three cats had died. Winter comes to Patagonia, and there is still no sign of Penny. If she is alive, she's losing her food supply, for the snow is driving the Wanakos out of her territory. Over 2,000 Wanakos live in the park, and the distinct family groups coalesce into large herds. Male aggression is suspended in the interests of survival, and the herds migrate west to greener pastures. Though we haven't seen Penny since the hunting incident, we've never given up hope that she's still alive. And while searching for her by the cave one day, we find puma tracks and our spirits soar. Are these Penny's prints? That evening we have the answer. our beautiful cat, still very much alive. It's great to see her again. Being with Penny day after day, I've learnt that the late evening, night and early morning are her most important hunting and feeding times. Hares are a favourite prey. And though I've always suspected that Penny is a youngish cat due to her rather impatient stalking, it's exciting to see her skills as a hunter improve with experience.
Watched by a pair of courting and wary grey foxes, Penny plays with her victim as a kitten would, enjoying her sport long into the night. Searching for Penny the next day, I find that the hare is not her only kill. The rapid thaw has exposed a dead Wanako to the condor's gaze. Pumas cover their kills with vegetation or snow to hide food that could last several days. But Penny stays nearby to discourage the condors from scavenging her meal. Pumas tend to eat only at night, whereas foxes are always alert for any opportunity, and these two compete for Penny's buried treasure. They mustn't get too preoccupied. Given half a chance, Penny would eat them too. Fox's speed nearly always saves them, and Penny seems weary. So after a long night's hunting, it's time to return to the den for her daytime sleep. With Penny back in her cave and the exposed carcass now obvious to the condors, it's safe for them to glide down in numbers. With their 10-foot wingspan, condors have amazing control in these turbulent skies and look big even in this mighty landscape. Dwarfed by the condor's bulk, the little grey fox will have to wait its turn. But there will be little left when the condors are finished. Adult males weigh in at 25 pounds and will quickly reduce the carcass to a skeleton. Three days' meat supply will be gone, and Penny will have to hunt again tonight. I wonder if hunger caused by losing the Wanako to the condors forced Penny to go sheep rustling. The next time I see her, she has a wound in her left thigh, inflicted by the hunter's dogs perhaps, or winged by a bullet. Fortunately, she doesn't seem to be limping, so maybe it's only a flesh wound. 
I worry that getting her used to me will put her at greater risk with other humans, but she clearly differentiates between us. For when a photographer friend tried to approach her, even camouflaged in my clothes, she fled. Brushing that branch with scent is one of the ways Penny marks her home range. She also sprays bushes and leaves droppings on trails to tell other cats she's passed by. Following Penny around, we've learnt she has a home range of over 60 square miles, overlapping with maybe two other females, but only one male. If she's to breed successfully, she not only has to stake out this home range and let the male know she's here, she must also find food, so she does a lot of walking. In the evening, I find Penny sniffing around above her den. She's keenly interested, as if she smells another cat, and maybe it's a male. Pumas become sexually mature between two and three years old, and if Penny is as young as I suspect, this could be her first encounter. Mountain lions can breed in any month, but down here in Patagonia, the pumas tend to have kittens in the spring. Her behaviour does suggest a male is around. She seems keen, but hesitant. Just like any young lady on a blind date. And there he is, a big male waiting by the den. Penny seems apprehensive. In fact, Rather touchingly, she circles round closer to me than him. Seems extraordinary that she trusts a human more than a puma. I feel quite honoured. He's not happy with me. Probably can't understand Penny's relaxed attitude. He doesn't seem to be too impressed by him. He's a powerful looking cat, easily recognised by those more distinct black and white markings on his face. Unlike Penny's rather laid back, provocative attitude, it doesn't look as though the male will relax while I'm here. So as he sits looking at his potential mate, I give them privacy and retreat back to camp. I see Penny and the male together just once more, in moonlight near our tents. If they did mate, gestation is about three months, so she might have cubs in the spring. Spring is a time of awakening and renewal, and the park becomes a mecca for wildlife. Birds flood into numerous lakes, Chilean flamingos, and ruddy ducks with their chest patting display. Gray foxes and their cubs will take advantage of this abundance of life, and maybe Penny has cubs too. But she's disappeared again, and must be hiding somewhere deep in the hills.
weeks pass and the summer sun draws moisture from the land. The world turns and autumn's chill creeps down from the mountains. But there's still no sign of Penny. On the arrival of autumn, the Wanakos gather into large groups in preparation for the coming winter, and Hugh continues his search for Penny near the herds. At last I find Penny again, and after all this time, her attitude to me seems different. Is it a warning to keep my distance? or a gesture of friendship. Either way, if she does have cubs, I hope she'll lead me to them. If they were born in the spring, they should have been out of the den for several weeks. I follow her into a steep-sided valley, at the bottom of which is a dried-up lake. This bush should break up my silhouette on the skyline. And, uh, yeah, there. I can just make her out in the marsh, lying on a bed of dried reeds. And she does have a cub. Ah, oh, two more playing nearby. Three in all, a normal sized litter. Must be about four months old. What charming little kittens they are. My joy at finding the cubs is short-lived, for in trying to find a better camera position, she spots me and is terrified, absolutely shaking with fear. Her wild instincts seem to have taken over completely. She's abandoning the cubs. Understandable, I guess. I suppose she thinks I'm a hunter. She's obviously choosing to protect her own life, or is she trying to draw me away from her cubs as mountain lions have been known to do in North America? Whatever the reason, I pray that her departure is only temporary. It's a tense situation. For filming wild animals, however well-intentioned, often disturbs them and can even put their lives at risk. And the animal's welfare must come first. But I've really blown it this time. I pull back to a safe distance from Penny and much to my relief, as darkness approaches, she relaxes and seems to accept me again. Then she starts heading back to the cubs. Using a special night vision lens, I hope to witness a happy reunion. Pumas can see really well in moonlight, but Penny also uses a harsh bark to locate her cubs. Though the quality of my night vision lens is poor, it sure is a relief to see the family safely together again. At four months old, the cubs are already weaned onto meat, so this means Penny must leave them frequently to go off hunting. And now she knows they're safe. That's exactly what she does. After the scare I gave Penny, I lose her for several days, but eventually find her to the west of her den. She only has two cubs, and I wonder where the third one has gone. 
Donny and I just walk and walk, scouring the hills for Penny and her cubs and clues of their presence. And about a week later, we come across one of Penny's old kills. And there, close to it, is a sad sight. The third cub, its body already desiccated by the relentless wind. Its skull is flat on one side. Must have been crushed by another puma, for nothing else is strong enough. It's a tearful moment, and we pray that Penny's other cubs will survive. Soon after this loss, Penny and her two surviving cubs return to the old den site. She knows it's a good place for hunting, and no doubt the cubs will be learning from her example. Long experience has taught Penny where to lie in wait for thirsty wanakos. Unfortunately, Penny's cubs have not yet learned the importance of keeping out of sight. Once discovered, Penny won't waste energy trying to remain hidden. She'll just move to another hunting ground. The cubs will go hungry once again, but theirs is a life of feast or famine. So if they survive to adulthood, they will face hardship many times. Penny is finding just how tough it is to raise a family, and driven by hunger, hunts in all weathers. Without surprise on her side, Penny has little chance against a fleet-footed hare, and she needs larger meals too. But the Wanakos have been driven west by the blizzards, and Penny must follow. Hungry or not, the cubs remain playful as they follow her trail. They're eight months old now, and I soon appreciate how effective their large paws are in soft snow. They glide over the surface while I struggle to keep up, drilled into deep drifts by 50 pounds of camera gear. But I'm desperate to see a successful Wanako hunt, and Penny is keen too. On this particular day, she walks six miles. But it may be worth it. Wanakos converge into large herds in harsh weather, not just for warmth and shelter, but to exploit the best forage. They feed more efficiently if there are many pairs of eyes for it can be a successful defence against puma attack. Penny's coat colour is a disadvantage in snow, but it's surprising just how close she can stalk without being seen. Every success there are many failures, and almost inevitably it seems, Penny is spotted. 
but she has another problem. Her quest for a meal has taken her deep into the home range of another cat, and it's watching us all from the top of the cliff. This one also has cubs, three large ones. I'm keen to find out who Penny's neighbour is, and though the cubs make themselves scarce and their mother is shy at first, she's remarkably tolerant. Living deep inside the park, perhaps she has little fear of humans. She's a superb cat, with that wide head and those large, pale jowls. And she has a much darker nose too. Completely different looks from Penny. And though I'm biased, she's not really as pretty. She's huge, must weigh close to 150 pounds, more the size of a male. Penny is extremely wary of this stranger, for pumas will defend their litters fiercely. So each family avoids confrontation by putting wild country between them. The cubs seem unwilling to do anything but play. And Penny is reluctant to leave the area too, for this is where the Wanakos are holed up for the winter. But she must retreat to ensure her cubs' safety. They'll be hungry again, but spring is on the way. With the thaw comes a food supply, for as winter loosens its icy grip on the land, the Wanakos migrate back to the area where Penny lives. She was obviously lying in ambush, for we discover a fresh killed Wanako, carefully hidden to await her return with the cubs. At dusk I walk down to my camera near the carcass, and with Wanakos to warn me of Penny's approach, I'm free to enjoy these glorious skies. Suddenly, like ghosts, the cats are beside me moving noiselessly through the grass. I sense a quiet menace in such silent stealth, but as with most animals, the threat of danger is largely in the imagination. Trouble is, I can only see through the special lens, and it sure feels spooky being surrounded by three large cats in the dark. The cubs are now a year old and need a lot of meat, so Penny is catching adult Wanakos. Standing six feet and weighing as much as 300 pounds, Wanakos are more than twice her size. Yet Penny not only kills them, she's also strong enough to drag them to safe feeding places. The 
sound of crunching bones must be like a Wanako's worst nightmare. Once they're replete, the cubs are free to play. But with dawn approaching fast, Penny must cover the carcass, as there's still at least four nights meet here for her growing family. Play is an essential part of the cubs' training as predators, developing muscles and hunting skills. But watching them romping about, you can't help feeling they're just having fun. They won't be independent until they're maybe 18 months old. So if they survive, Penny still has six months hard work ahead. And if she survives the threats of starvation and poaching, she will start all over again. She might live more than eight years, raising at least four litters of mischievous kittens. With the dawn chorus in full voice, Penny leads the cubs away, taking them to different parts of the home range each day to ensure they know the best places to hunt and hide. Their survival is important. The pumas are a vital part of the natural cycle in these mountains. From the sun's power to the growing plants, the plant eaters and their death and decay, all these elements must be balanced if the land is not to be damaged. In turn, pumas themselves are profoundly dependent on the life support systems they help to create. So it's not just sentiment that makes Penny and her cubs important. Pumas, cougars, mountain lions, they must all survive if these wild places are not to lose their essential spirit, their inspiration. But the story is not quite complete. I heard recently that Penny and the cubs are still alive. And though I'll always be disappointed that fate didn't allow me to see her actually catch a Wanaka, maybe that is how it should be. She's kept many secrets, retained her mystery and dignity. And I have many wonderful memories. For this completely wild puma gave me the privilege of sharing part of her life, even trusting me enough to sleep by my side. The presence in the mountains is not a shadow, it's a shining light.
We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library.